Hi everyone, welcome to the Cambridge Creatives Q&A with Richard Eyre. I'm Hannah. And I'm Ellie, and we are the founders of Cambridge Creatives. We're a student-run creative collective. We are curating a series of talks with world-renowned professionals in film, TV and theatre. So please follow our Facebook page to find out more about future events. Just a couple of housekeeping rules before we begin. If you have any questions for our guest speaker, please type them out on the Q&A function, which is separate from the ch chat function at the bottom, um, and we will read them, out to you at, read them out for you at the end. Just bear with us if there are any technical difficulties and let us know in the chat if there are any problems hearing or seeing us. Enjoy the Q&A. So our guest doesn't really need an introduction, but Richard Eyre is a world-renowned film, theatre, television and opera director. He was director of the National Theatre between 1987 and 1997. He has most notably directed both Jonathan Price and Daniel Day-Lewis as Hamlet. He's directed Notes on a Scandal, The Children Act, and has famously won five Olivier Awards. We are really honoured to have this trailblazing director speak. So my first question for you, Richard, is when did you know that you wanted to work in the creative industries or even to direct? Well, it if I can pick up on uh, classic politicians tactic on your question, I've never thought of um, what I do as being part of an industry. And I always slightly recoil when people say you had a career in the creative industries because I don't think of myself as having had a career at all. I think of myself as starting to do a piece of work which led to another piece of work which led to another piece of work and if you aggregate all the pieces of work then you could call it a career but a, a career implies forethought and uh, ambition I never had the ambition to run the National Theatre uh, I guess I, I should go back to when I was um, very young when I was, I didn't go to the theatre until I was almost 16. Um, I never saw a straight play. I grew up in rural Dorset. My father had been in the Navy and then he became a farmer. Um, my family weren't interested in the arts and um, I went to see a production of Hamlet at the Bristol Old Vic uh, when I was nearly 16 and I was completely capsized by it. And so that's when I wanted to be, I thought I want to be part of this, whatever this was, um, the arts, literature, acting, directing. Um, I managed to get into Cambridge University as um, to read general sciences, and then had to admit that my maths wasn't good enough. I switched to English, obviously, because all you have to do is read books. Um, and um, I got very involved in the in uh, student theatre and was an actor. And I became a professional actor. And the only thing I directed when I was at Cambridge was a short film starring Graham Garden and Eric Idle who were contemporaries of mine. Um, then I, I became an actor and um, then I realized I'd reached my ceiling or, um, uh, as an actor. And um, it was like admitting that my maths wasn't good enough to continue doing sciences. And, and I persuaded somebody to allow me to direct a production and that's how I became a director. What was your like first professional job as a director or professional production? Um, well, I was in a musical in Leicester, um, mu The Boyfriend. Um, do you know The Boyfriend? No. Um, yeah, old musical. And um, I asked some of the actors in the show if they would agreed to be directed by me and they said they would and I did a production of a play called The Knack by Angelico which had um, four characters, three men, one woman. Um, it was a very lively inventive piece and 
several people who run theatres came to see my production, which was on for a Sunday night. And that's how I, I mean, the trouble being a director is that you have to direct in order to demonstrate that you can direct. And you need to persuade somebody to give you an opportunity for directing. Very true. Do you have any advice for students who would like to follow in your footsteps on whether that's in directing or just theatre in general? Um, you have to be prepared to be disappointed. Um, I mean, you have to be prepared for rejection. You have to be prepared for criticism. Um, you have to be dogged and willful and lucky. And you have to make the best of, of your luck. And the exasperating thing about directing is that um, it's like gardening. There's a wonderful poem by a poet, Scottish poet called Douglas Dunn, which starts, only a garden can teach gardening. And that's, that's the case with directing. But how do you start? How do you get the job? Um, luck and persistence. Oh. Yep. Perfect, thank you. What made you want to be the artistic director at the National Theatre? Um, and do you have any particular favourite memories or lessons that you've learned? Um, I never thought, I'm sorry, that's my office. <laughs> I never thought that I was going to be director of the National Theatre. I didn't, when I was a young director, um, when I was starting out, I never thought my ambition is to be director of the National Theatre. Um, I became a protege of Peter Hall, who was running the National Theatre, who took over from Laurence Olivier, and um, worked with Peter Hall. I was an associate at the National Theatre from the early 80s. And about after I'd been working off and on at the National Theatre, Peter Hall said to me, you know, I think you should run the National Theatre. Um, and it was the first it had entered my mind. And after one meeting where all Peter, Peter and all his associates were sitting around a table and it was on a Saturday in February and it was snowing outside the room and it was an oddly sort of bleak day because we were talking about shortage of funds and what would happen to the National Theatre and I suddenly thought oh I could do this I could have a go at this. And then I found myself um, being picked out by the chairman of the National Theatre Board and encouraged by Peter to, as it were, run for office. Um, so I got the job. I found it incredibly daunting uh, initially, and it took me about 18 months to find my feet. Um, the thing that I learnt, and I think the most important thing for anybody running a theatre of any size, is to learn whatever the word is that is the opposite of schadenfreude. Um, you're all very clever, you know that. I, um, what, I, I take joy in other people's successes and take joy in encouraging your contemporaries, your rivals, the, the new generation. And um, that's the way you'll get joy out of the job. If you regard it as um, a competition in which you, know, you have a privileged position and you're not going to allow your rivals in, then I think you'll have a miserable time. And as for, did you have any um, favourite actors or directors who you worked with? Oh, gosh, yeah. Um, who, well, I recruited um, 
several women directors, Phila Deloitte, uh, Deborah Warner, um, Katie Mitchell, um, uh, and Nick Heitner, Sam Mendes, um, oh, who else? Declan Donnellan. Um, I, and I guess a generation, the generation below me, who were all knocking at my door and I thought it was my job to enfranchise the new generation. Mm, you said before that the most important attribute for anyone who runs a theatre is generosity, that you've got to be prepared to enfranchise people who are more successful and just different from yourself. Yeah. How do you think that, do you think that British theatre has improved its diversity of cast and crew and do you think that there's more that they can continue to do? Um, yeah, it, it's changed. I introduced in, uh, when I took over the National Theatre, a colourblind casting. Um, and that was a, um, a publicly stated policy. Um, and I introduced um, extraordinary thing, women directors to the National Theatre. And astonishingly, this 87, 88, there had hardly been any women directors working at the National Theatre. So the whole landscape has changed a lot and maybe it should have happened and it probably should have happened earlier. And um, it, particularly in the question of diversity, um, you should, one should ask why are there not more BAME directors, writers, well, they're starting to emerge, but they're starting to emerge because they've been given opportunities. But these things in the arts can't just happen by a sort of fiat um, because it does nobody any favor just simply to say, oh, you're a woman, therefore, you should be writing this play or directing this play or, or your skin is a different color from mine. So um, you ought to be acting. Um, you have to have the talent. I mean, that's the thing that is unfair is talent is unequally distributed. But when there are equal talents, you've got to encourage the people who have been uh, disenfranchised in the past. Very true. In terms of opportunities for yourself, how did you refine your craft as a director? Did you do it just by learn by doing or, or did you have anyone who mentored you? You spoke of um, being a protege. Um, not um, officially um, mentored. I, I watched productions and I learned from the way that people did things but in the end it's not about what they do it's, it's about the why you have to develop a sense of um, yourself of making a series of choices I mean the choice of why are you doing a particular play why what does the world of the play represent to you and People say, you know, do, do you have a political approach? And I say, it's, it's, it's impossible not to have a political approach because you're making decisions about where, what people's lives are when you're, when you're directing a play. You'll say, well, what do these people live on? What do they do for work? How do they... Um, how do they occupy themselves? What are their leisure activities? Um, and what are their relationships? And, and, and class is something that you can't ignore. And uh, so all these things come into directing, um, but whether they come in explicitly or implicitly varies with the, with the director. But you have to keep asking the questions. And I thought when I started as a director that the point was that the director had 
to have all the answers. And it's not true. The director must have a sense of, of the map and the journey, but should be asking the questions of the people who are accompanying the director on the, on the journey. So in, in terms of your process of approaching different sorts of plays, whether that's Shakespeare and early modern or 20th and 21st century writing, do you have a, a kind of a similar why questioning approach or do you, depending on the text, you approach it differently? No, I think I, I approach it the same. And when you're doing a Shakespeare play, particularly a, a very familiar Shakespeare play, you have to put yourself in the mind of somebody who has never seen the play before and um, who isn't coming with a load of baggage of, of meanings and, and interpretations, but is coming to watch the play as an innocent observer. And so often people try and overcomplicate Shakespeare. And you have, to say, yeah, I can see that you could argue that. On the other hand, I put myself in the position of somebody seeing this, hearing this line for the first time. And I cannot believe that it holds those meanings because the thing about theater, I guess the thing I find most exciting is it exists by definition in the present tense. Um, if it's not in the present tense, it's not theatre. The other thing is that it, it is obliged to concentrate on the human being, the humane aspect of the world, because that is theatre. Put a human being who is generally between sort of four and six feet and doesn't... You know, vary that much on a stage with living human beings watching them that's a state of of theater so it you can't make theater abstract it just can't you know there will always be a human who is you know vulnerable and um all the things that humans are and ambiguous and and this is why above all we should be grateful for Shakespeare who's the great um as it were humanitarian writer because he shows human beings in every stage of, of the, every aspect of the spectrum of, of humanity. Very true um in terms of basic humanity of characters did that sort of reassure you when you directed operas and musicals even though they're very different forms there's a, a foundation of understanding your characters that you can work from yeah um when i the first opera i directed was la traviata the royal opera house um 25 years ago and the production is still in the repertoire and um when i started off i said the, th the thing I can bring, I don't want to be a dilettante about directing opera, but I can bring the sort of rigor to, to investigating character and character in action and dialogue um, that I would apply to, let's say, a play by Chekhov. So I um, made the singers uh, just recite, talk through the libretto before I said, please don't sing. I know you can all sing brilliantly, but don't sing. Just act the libretto. So I can see, because sometimes you're, you're working in a foreign language. You know, in the case of, of Verdi, it's, it's in Italian. Um, and the cast I had, I don't know if, People know La Taviata, but the Violetta was a Romanian singer called Angela Gheorghu, who's become very famous. Um, the 
Tenor was uh, an American, and the um, the father was um, an Italian. Um, and you have to say, yes, but when you're working on a play, you say, but, but what does the character really mean here? What are, what are they feeling? What are they doing? And that's something that can easily get forgotten in opera because the music can carry you away and the sound. But for me, the sound, it's not secondary, but it has to be combined with meaning. And when it is, it's supremely moving. And when it isn't, it's a lovely sound, but um, empty. It sounds like you have a really close working relationship with the actors and um, singers that you work with. Is it, is it important to you to have these long-term creative and personal relationships with actors, for example, like Judy Dench and, and Ian McKellen? Yeah, I think it's important that, I mean, in the end, the performers are the people who are, I mean, I know, you know, how wonderful directors are, huh? but um, in the end, it's however brilliant the director or the writer or the, the, the mise-en-scene, it's the performers who are actually whose souls are at stake, whose lives are at stake on stage. And the audience is sitting there and they're thinking, you know, they're, they're not thinking, oh, how wonderfully directed. Uh, they are in, they're in touch with the people on stage. So they're the people, it's the same with music. Uh, they're the people who are communicating. Um, and so the directors and writers are in a sense the, um, the architects and builders, but the thing itself are the, is the performers. And do you have any um, particular favourite memories of working with these uh, individuals? So, for example, with Ian McKellen, you worked with him in Richard III, and then 26 years later in The Dresser. How, how was that? Um, well, pretty wonderful. Um, Ian is, uh, he's very, very exacting. And he lets nothing go. And so um, you just, I remember... Um, we were doing Richard the Third, and um, we we had started to preview, and there were things that were not right yet with the production. And um, Ian and I had a meeting at nine o'clock uh, in the morning, and I said, Ian, I can't rehearse today because my father had just died. And I have to go down, and I wanted to see my other before he was taken off. And Ian said, oh, I'm so sorry. And then straight in started talking about what we needed to do about X, Y, and Z. And I find that admirable. Um, unsentimental, tough, uh, but in the end, that sort of re I think is essential. She's frozen. And you've adapted several Shakespeare plays for film and TV. Sorry, is the connection all right? You're back. Yeah, I've done um, <laughs> King Lear and Henry IV, part one and two, yeah. And do you think that film provides a unique opportunity to accentuate certain aspects that can't be fulfilled on stage? Um, yeah, uh, well, film is such a, a different medium and I guess filming a theatre play, it is a sort of hybrid. When I did the film of Lear, um, it was, inter I had, uh, Anthony Hopkins, who I think is the greatest Lear I will ever see, and I'd be surprised if there's, you know, several generations, if there's a better Lear than him. Um, but I had to, uh, the ground rules was that the film had to be no more than two hours long. 
And if you, however fast you play the theater text of King Lear, you can't get it in under, well, two hours, 40 minutes, I think. So I had to make radical cuts. And many of them are achieved by being able to use a camera to make a point rather than a line of, uh, or, or a whole speech of, of explanation. Um, so that was, that was actually quite invigorating, um, being licensed to or being obliged to make those decisions. I've got to take that out. I've got to take this subplot out. Um, and in the end, I think it was, it, it's, it made for um, clarity. I mean, of course, it's not the play. It's a version of the play, but then in a sense, every single production of a Shakespeare play is a version and very few people present Shakespeare uncut. Um, we all make choices and I think that's a perfectly honorable thing to do. And it'll, you know, doing Shakespeare's like writing in sand and the tide comes in and, you know, washes it away and somebody else has a go and the remain so I never quite get it when people are outraged why what have they done with this play I think well somebody's had a go um the play remains you know nobody's burning the first folio um you know the plays aren't destroyed in some way they're added to, they accrue different meanings. And I think that's what's one of the wonderful things about Shakespeare. And how far do you think that we can push those boundaries? Obviously some modern day adaptations, particularly in film, you know, have none of the script in them, but are still versions of Shakespeare. This is the really odd thing about Shakespeare, that in some ways, what is Shakespearean remains and I've seen Shakespeare productions in Nigeria, in Yoruba, in um, Romanian, in Polish, in Russian uh, uh, and not a single word of the text and yet in some way they're true to Shakespeare, to the Shakespearean and so it begs the question of what that is and it's really hard to put your finger on, but something to do with the, the ambiguities of being human, the sort of the, the, the softness of humans and the hardness of humans and the, the ambivalence of, of sexuality of, of humans and the sort of benign qualities of, of nature and humanity as against the, the destructive qualities and those versuses, those valences are at the heart of, of, of what is Shakespearean. So that they do, you know, one of, I love um, Kurosawa's, the Japanese director's film, he did a wonderful film of Macbeth and a wonderful film of, of King Lear. And they're not a word of the text, but in some way they're both truly Shakespearean. So you just have to, I, I love the, my favorite story about what is Shakespearean is Berlioz, the composer, um, when he was 23, went to see, this is about the 1830s, 40s, um, went to see, a production of Hamlet by an Irish, uh, English Irish company at the Odeon Theatre and fell in love with Ophelia, who was and eventually married her, disastrously, a woman called Harriet Smithson. But he said that he saw this play and he said, and, and my life began and uh, I rose again and I was able to think and feel and, and walk. 
and he didn't speak a single word of English at that time. That's so incredible. It, it, it is, and that's Shakespearean. Yeah, I completely agree. We've just finished our Shakespeare term and have definitely come to a similar conclusion. Um, just to move on to some questions on film, um, Iris, Notes on a Scandal and the Children Act are all based on books. Do you prefer making films based from books? Oh, no, no, um, no, it's just opportunity. Um, probably the most successful film I've made was a film for television about the Falcons War, um, which you probably haven't seen. Um, was on in 1987. It was on five years after the Falklands War. And it was very, very controversial. And it was called Tumble Down. And that was by a writer who died last year called Charles Wood. And it was an original script uh, about a soldier, an officer in the, in the Falklands War. Um, no, I would love, and. Uh, um, I did a script, um, a film with Ian McEwan called um, The Imitation Game for um, the BBC in 80, uh, about 1980, um, much better than the later film called The Imitation Game. Um, my film starred Harriet Walter and the title, of course, is um, Alan Turing um, and the later film with Ben Mubach, um borrowed the same title. But uh, no, I did a film also, original script with Ian McEwan called The Plowman's Lunch, um, which was about Thatcherism, I guess. Do you think because you have such a close relationship with with collaborators like Ian McEwan, is is that the reason why you've worked with him so many times? Um, like on on the Children Act, and apparently you were meant to be the intended director for Atonement. Yeah, I was. Um, I was going to direct Atonement, um, and the reason I pulled out of Atonement was because I had a contractual commitment to direct the American version of Mary Poppins, which I had done in the West End. And because um, for various reasons, the production of Atonement was delayed, I had to pull out of it. And, um, and Joe Wright took over and I think made a very good job of it. Um, so I was sad not to, not to do that. Um, and I'd, I had worked on the script with and, and engaged Christopher Hampton to write the script, the screenplay. Um, and he remained as the writer of the screenplay. What was it like working with Ian McEwan again, eventually on, on the Children Act? And did you have a role in the um, sort of adaptation process as well? I, I, I did. Ian's um, a very old friend. We used to live in Stockwell in South London. Uh, he lived around the corner. So I guess I met him late 70s. So uh, however long that is, 40 years ago plus. Um, so I've, I've, we remained close friends and um, we see each other often. And um, I read his books at an early stage and um, and I send him things I write and he's always incredibly generous and he comes to see most of the stuff I do so we're proper friends. Sounds really lovely. <laughs> um, with, with the Children Act did you um, always intend to, to cast Emma Thompson as Fiona and had you did you have a previous sort of creative relationship with her as well? Um, I knew Emma, but I'd never worked with Emma. I knew her quite well, but I'd never worked with her. And I always thought that we couldn't make the film 
if we didn't have Emma, that there was no other actress of her um, generation who could do what she did. And I think it is just an exemplary performance. Um, and um, so I guess the answer is that we wouldn't have made it without Emma. And I think that's okay. often true of films. I mean, the uh, Notes on a Scandal, we wouldn't have made without Judy. Yes, Kate Blanchett, fabulous. But without Judy, um, we, the film wouldn't have been made in the same way as Iris wouldn't have been made without Judy. It really, she really holds the film. Um, do you think that actors like um, Emma Thompson and Judy Dench um, sort of make it easier when when you're filming such sensitive scenes, like like in the Children Act, when you're discussing conflict between the court and and Jehovah's Witnesses? Um, do they do they make these hard scenes easier to film? Um. I guess so. I mean, in the case of Iris, um, it was hard because um, the character was had Alzheimer's. Um, I'd seen my mother had Alzheimer's, so I was very, very familiar with it. And I think, I think, if it had been somebody less brilliant than Judy, it would have been difficult because I would have been constantly saying, no, actually, it's not quite like that. But Judy is such an extraordinary, instinctive actor. And she somehow, you can't see her working. It's sort of some kind of mental osmosis that she takes the character on board. She doesn't like to talk about it. To she doesn't articulate what the character is or what she's going to do. It's just there. It's an instinct for it, and it comes out absolutely true. Um, I think I think the same is true with Emma. But Emma is much much more articulate. But in the end, however articulate actors are, they've got to be it rather than talk it. What do you think that the future um, for theatre or even film will hold in a post-corona world? Oh, I'm really, really, really depressed about what might happen with theatre. Um, a number of not-for-profit theatres, I think, can't survive because they don't have the reserves beyond a, a, a few months more. So we'll need to be bailed out. And a number of commercial producers will have lost uh, a lot of, of potential income and, and therefore their capital and their investment in future productions would be prejudiced. Um, I'm, I'm just really worried about the performing arts in general. And But I see today um, Simon Rattle and Mark Elder were saying they're worried about what they see as a catastrophe for classical music. And I, I think the same is true of the theatre, of all the performing arts. Film um, in the end, well, it's been a great uh, lockdown for Netflix, hasn't it? Um, but, you know, unless they can get back into proper filmmaking, that's just going to run out of material. Um, it's, it's frankly terrifying for the, uh, um, for the performing arts. Uh, and I'm not being hyperbolic. Um, it really is frightening, and let's pray that something 
is going to ease in the next two or three months um, because it, if it doesn't it'll be like you know the there were three plagues at the end of the 16th century um, uh, 59 anyway there were three over a period of about um, 12 years 14 years and the theatres were closed in each case for a year and then they reopened but we're talking about um, you know small units whereas now theatre is a very um, intense uh it, it requires a lot of different um skills and and uh activities associated so there are um set builders and and uh sound technicians and and uh makers and painters and apart from the people who are conspicuous by being on stage I don't know it's 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 a terrible time yeah we're all just crossing our fingers and hoping yeah. that yeah at least they'll be adequately supported in some other way even if they can't open yeah. um but do you have any projects in the pipeline at the moment yeah i do can you disclose but, any I, but, um i can't i don't have two two things um which i'm desperate to put on um and uh Actually, three, no, three, which I'm, but I, I can't, I'm not going to say because it's about the only thing I'm superstitious about is if you talk up future projects, it's, you know, they, they vaporize. But yes, I do. Um, and one of them is a project that I've sort of conceived during lockdown and it's incredibly painful irony that there's no way of at the moment of achieving it. Indeed. Um, soon we're going to have some questions from the audience. So can everyone type your questions into the Q&A box, not the chat function, and we'll read them out. Um, but while we're waiting, we're going to ask our final questions. Our first one is, we're quite curious, what was it like receiving a knighthood? Um, what was it like? Well, there was sort of, um, there was a period where I thought, do I, do I accept a knighthood? And then I thought, my sister said, oh, you can't possibly do that. Um, it's, it's shameful. Um, but then I thought, actually, I'm very um, flattered by it. And um, it meant recognition um, and it meant for somebody who is endemically insecure, uh, it was significant addition to a sense of, of security. But it did feel for a long time like um, having a sort of string attached to my waist with a tin can, pulling a tin can behind me. And I, um, I would, people would say, Sir Richard, and I would think, who, who is this person? And um, now I'm afraid that I'm inured to it. <laughs> Sounds good. Um, and lastly, do you have any TV or film recommendations for us to fill our very long lockdown summers? Oh, God. Um, well, I guess you'll have seen... Um, what have I seen most recently that's really good? Um, well, Roma, you've, you've probably seen, haven't you? I mean, you've seen other. Um, oh, gosh. Tokyo Story, have you ever seen that Japanese film? It's wonderful. You can get that on the BFI streaming service. I, I would, I'd watch that. Um, Heimat, have you ever seen Heimat? Yeah. Well, it's, that's, it's a German series that was made in the late 80s. And it's completely brilliant. It sort of starts in about 1930 and goes 
through and it's about I mean, the rise of of nazism that's pretty wonderful but i don't know watch any films from early 60s french you know true film um italian films uh rocco and his brothers have you seen that any um uh yeah i mean old films thank you um ellie do you want to ask the first q a question yes perfect we've got a very excited olivia um who is very keen on attending so um she asked um who do you think is the most exciting new playwright at the moment um new playwright um well i guess the ubiquitous James Graham. Um, I think it's good. There are a lot of very exciting um, women playwrights, and um, Martin McDonough. Um, oh gosh, this is who is the most exciting? I would still. If you said to me, um, Carol Churchill's written a new play, I would be very excited. Um, Polly Finley. Um, I, I can't really answer. Yeah, beyond that. Yeah. That, that's a good list. Um, someone asks, what do you think makes Anthony Hopkins Lear better than Laurence Olivier's Lear? Um, I think that Anthony Hopkins is um, invariably truthful and I think that Laurence Olivier is constantly thinking about the effect he's making rather than the truth of what he's playing. Um. This is a question from Archie. With your experiences in the National Theatre, how do you feel that uh, theatres and art spaces can reduce a perceived elitism and work on getting a range of audiences from all classes? Um, well, I think the way you reduce elitism is through education and through visits to the theatre. As I said earlier, I didn't go to see a straight play until I was nearly 16. Um, and then I was I was converted. Um, now I wasn't from an unprivileged background, but I was from a, a artistically deprived background. And I think I think there's a lot of um, wrong-headed thinking about elitism in the arts. I mean, by definition, um, arts like theatre and opera concerts are elitist because a limited number of people can see the event and can share the event at any one time and um the point about not-for-profit theaters subsidized theaters is that they endeavor to put the seat prices at uh, a point where they're available to um i wouldn't say to everyone but to um, people who they're, they're within a reasonable grasp of, of most people who are earning. Um, so it's only through education that you get the habit of going to the theatre, going to opera. Um, it's seeing the thing itself and realising that it's for you, that, that there is something in it for you. I don't think that screenings um, really bridge the gap because they're not theatre. It's, it's a sort of odd, you know, it's a substitute. It, it's, it's not theatre, it's a form of drama on TV or um, filmed drama. And it has the one thing that, it lacks the one thing that makes theatre distinctive, which is being in the same space and at the same time as the performers. And um, that's just what theatre is. You may think um, that's rubbish, but 
that's what theater is um you can't you can't escape it um yeah thank you is there a um anna saunter wants to know is there a plan to adapt McEwen's new book machines like me for the screen um no ian and i have talked about it and ian slightly feels um he would love to have a book that doesn't need to be adapted to film or television in order to be validated. And it's, I remember the, um, I think it was Philip Roth who said, you know, that he, he was very, very happy to write a novel about which people didn't say this would make a great film. <laughs> and, um, I think that's Ian's feeling about machines like me, um, which I loved. Uh, and I could see that it would make a very good TV series. Um, we've got a question here from an anonymous attendee, but you described the future as frightening in the future post Corona. Um, what advice do you have for people who are beginning their creative journeys now with more time on their hands? Well, something is going to come after, isn't it? I mean, we're not going to spend the rest of our lives in lockdown, even if, you know, it means that herd immunity um, is brought in and essentially people are saying, well, people like you, like me, who are over 70 are redundant. So, you know, you're, you're going to, die, you'll be culled, there'll be a great cull. Um, there's still going to be the desire to make, to tell stories, um, to be in the presence of the storyteller. So I'm very optimistic about the survival of theatre in some form. What worries me is the survival of theatre in its present form performed in um, theatre buildings that can't be supported um, by companies that can't um, financially continue to exist. But the, the art form will prosper, it will continue. So anybody involved, I mean, in the, in the 70s, there was a huge proliferation of, of fringe theatres, small, groups of people who felt they, you know, there the were the big companies and they couldn't get into the big companies. So they started to write plays, uh, uh, acting plays, direct plays, design plays in very, very small theatres. And those people became really the authoritative, authoritative directors of the and writers of the 80s and, and, and 90s. So I wouldn't be that pessimistic about the art form, just the existing means of, of um, uh, sustaining it. Um, Aaron wanted to know, how should film and theatre directors handle the almost inevitable or occasional um, instance of failure or rejection? Failure is, it's endemic. I mean, that's what being an artist um, means that you're going to fail, I don't know, 50% of the time. You're going to fail in your, um, in your view, repeatedly. And you go on, and as the famous Beckett expression, you fail better. Um, and I can't, there is no way of, of, I don't know a way of not being um, hurt by failure and adverse criticism. Um, and there's a, there's a wonderful, there's the, do you know, Garrison Keillor, the um, 
like Wobegon guy said, there is only one acceptable review for anybody involved in, in creative acts. It's the review that starts, hail to you, sun god, we salute you as our leader. And, you know, extravagant praise, but of course you never believe it. And there's something about being creative that is clearly about asserting yourself, but I don't know any creative person who isn't consumed by self-doubt at the moment that they are asserting themselves. Uh, we've got another question from an anonymous attendee. Do you have any Shakespeare plays that you haven't directed before and you would love to direct if you had the chance? Yeah, I do. I'd love to direct Measure for Measure. Um, and I don't know why I haven't. It's it's difficult play, but I think absolutely wonderful. And, um, and also The Tempest, and I had... I had a scenario for The Tempest and I thought I was going to be able to do it um, last year, but didn't. But it involves Ariel constantly being in the air and flying and flying in from the audience and remaining above the action the whole time until, and always asking for her freedom. And then finally, Ariel comes down to the stage and is unclipped by Prospero and Prospero leaves Ariel and of course Ariel doesn't know what to do because Ariel is no longer able to fly. Um, but it, it's quite technically complicated. Yeah, I was going to say I think that would be a interesting experience for the actor to be suspended for the whole time. Yeah. The actor I had in mind was the gymnast Simone Biles. I don't know if you know this, she's Olympic gold medal winner. And if you watch, she's completely weightless. Yeah. Um, and absolutely fabulous. That's how I imagine Ariel. That's amazing. A beautiful analogy. Um, do you have any tips for dealing with diva performers? An anonymous attendee wants to know. Oh, God. Um, well, you've got to be patient. And you've got to acknowledge that they are, however difficult, um, frightened. You know, they're, by definition, they're going to be talented people. Um, and they're going to be people who find their talent hard to live with. Um, but in the end, they're the people who have to, they're the people who are selling the tickets, who have to go on stage. So, you know, you've got to find a way of, of a comedy, even if you're just constantly reassuring. And even if they know that as you reassure that, you know, you're talking bullshit, you you just have to stick in there and it's vanity on the part of the director to walk away and say i'm you know i can't i'm not going to deal with this i think we've probably got time for one last question um we've got a question asks opera audiences are getting older how do you think we can get younger uh, younger audiences to enjoy opera just um, by seeing it, by, I mean, I remember uh, this production I was talking about of La Traviata that has been on for 25 years at the Royal Opera House. Occasionally it's, you know, it's revived every 18 months. And sometimes I've said to young actors I've been working with, oh, do you want to go and see a dress rehearsal? Um, and they sort of, uh, I don't know, uh, maybe. And I think of two actors who are very young, early 20s, going on and being just in the way that I was when I saw Hamlet at the age of almost 16. I was capsized by the experience. 
and and I think unless you're unless you catch it no amount of you know you or me saying oh it's absolutely wonderful you know that you should see it um unless you can get it experience it and in in that sense it's like religion i mean i'm not a religious person and i find it difficult to understand people who say well i believe and and in the end it's they believe because they've experienced belief and that's like you know an art form you are either moved by it or you're not if you're not then why should you be forced to try and enjoy it i think that's perfect final words <laughs> so <laughs> thank you thank you very much richard for your wonderful answers and for giving us your time and thank you to everyone else who joined the call and asked amazing questions thank you thank you hannah thanks ellie uh, it's, it's great pleasure Thank you so much. Please do like our Facebook page for any more updates and register for our next Q&A uh, with Josie Rourke on Saturday the 13th at 6pm. Thank you. Thank Bye -bye. you. Bye-bye. So